Now, Jacob, last week we talked about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was going to offer up Isaac. God provided a substitute so that he did not have to do that. And remember, Abraham's promise from God was the fact that his descendants were going to be as multiple as the stars in the sky. And Abraham had one son. And then Isaac meets his wife and they get married and they deal with infertility just like Abraham and Sarah. And they're praying and they pray to God, God, would you open up the womb? Because remember, we've promised that through me that the descendants would be as many as the stars in the sky. And God blessed them and opened up the womb for twins. So we're not really just, I mean, out of the blocks, just so speedy that we have one child and now two children, okay? It's not like what we have here next week when we start talking about Joseph and the 12 sons. But when we get to that, we look at two children in the womb, twins. And and if you've ever had twins, I haven't, but uh, some people have, and you realize that that there's kicking and movement in the womb with just one child. But Rebecca really dealt with a struggling within her, and she would constantly say, there is this battle going on within me. And you talk about sibling rivalry, and you talk about families that have it all together. This isn't the family. In fact, if your family's less than perfect, if you have crazy people in your family, if you have arguing, if you have sibling rivalry, then this is actually the exact family that we get introduced to this morning. And, and when the babies are being born, Esau is the older one, and he comes out first. And Jacob, our character of study this morning, comes out doing what? Grabbing the heel of his brother. That's already, you know, my brother and I fought. We did. That's just what brothers did. Over anything and everything, I'm sure it was all very important stuff. Probably not. Who got the remote control? Or who had to get up and change the TV for dad? You know, because we, we, were, we were the remote controls, right? Some of y'all remember that. But the sibling rivalry started in the womb. And as they're exiting the womb, Jacob is grabbing the heel of his older brother. Almost like a tug of war that started from birth. And round one of, of this wrestling match from our professional wrestler, Jacob, happens between Jacob and Esau. It's found if you have your scripture, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Genesis chapter 25. It's on page 30 of your chronological Bible or back in January 9th. We're cruising through this year. Welcome to March. We're in January 9th in our characters, but we're going to catch up. I promise. We're about to just start. We're picking up the pace. So you see this. They're older. They've grown. There's this big rivalry. You see kind of the reason why in the first two verses. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So here you have the tale of two twins. These twins, one of them is the man's man. He is the hunter. He's all hairy. He's kind of red-faced. He spends most of his time outside. He loves the outdoors. He would have the outdoor channel or he'd have his own show on the outdoor channel. And he was kind of your man's man. And then you have Jacob who was, in, in all essence, a mama's boy. Okay, that's not a negative thing. There's some mama's boys out there who just love their mamas. That's a great thing. But you see there's some favoritism in the parents. See, Esau was his dad's favorite. Jacob was his mom's. And there can never be anything good when favoritism is brought out in parenting. Now, Parenting 101, we say no, favoritism is wrong. We would never do it. And of course, we'd all say that. But it's a reality in families that one kid feels slighted from one parent or closer to another. That's just what happens. And when that happens, trouble is on the way. And see exactly what the trouble is. You've got these two, one's a hunter, one's in the tent. He'd rather be in the kitchen or at home, uh, hanging out, not really much of an outdoors guy until later on in his life. He says, now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that, some of that red stew for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. Okay, you've heard of starving to death. He was to that point. So what is a birthright to me? 
Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him, sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob gave Esau some bread, stew of the lentils. Then he ate, drank, arose, and went away. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The first wrestling match that Jacob goes on, the swindler, the, the schemer, the scammer, he was a con man. He's in there cooking up stew and it smelled so good. And Esau had been hunting, not maybe a day, maybe days. And he comes stumbling in and says, I'm so hungry, I could eat anything. And the smell and the aroma of the stew, he says, give me some of that stew or I may die of starvation. And at that point, a family member, a brother has the opportunity. Do I serve others or serve myself? And in his con artist mind set, Jacob says, ah, oh, this is a great opportunity not to serve, but to steal. See, Jacob was so disgruntled at his brother's birthright. He so much wanted to be loved and appreciated and favored by his dad. That as he stirs that stew and looks at his weary brother, who's literally famished, he says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a bowl of this stew for your birthright. And Esau let his hunger absolutely drive him to do something that he would regret the rest of his life. How often do we hunger for something that our culture says, this smells so good, it tastes so good, this will give you satisfaction. This will fill your heart and your stomach. This will bring you fulfillment. And we hunger for that and we crave that and we can almost smell it and taste it. And our culture says, if you just reach this level of popularity, if you just eat this or drink this or live here or drive this, then you will be satisfied. And we make a deal, all right? I'll compromise who I am, what I believe, what I know is true for just a taste of what this world has to offer. Is our appetite from the culture, from the world, or from God's word. And Jacob takes advantage of his brother and he absolutely steals the birthright. And Esau at that moment, he had a kind of a sibling rivalry with his brother. Now he had a hatred toward his brother. And it continued and this division continued to grow wider and wider until our next wrestling match, which is Jacob versus Isaac. Just a couple pages over on page 33, Genesis 27, 18. Isaac was getting older. In fact, his eyesight was going bad. He was about to die. And it was customary for them to, to bless the older child. And so he tells his older son, hey, why don't you go out? Kill me some game and prepare me one of my favorite dishes. And when you bring it back, we'll have the ceremony where you feed me and I bless you. And he said this, and unfortunately his wife overheard him. And remember, his wife's favorite wasn't Esau, but it was Jacob. And so when, when Esau goes out to go hunting to kill some game to bring back for his father and receive the blessing of the father, Rebecca starts scheming and he says, she says, here's what you need to do. You go out, you put on your brother's clothes, you try to smell like your brother. And Jacob was like, no, this is gonna be, this is disastrous because he's real hairy and I'm real smooth skinned. We're so different. He said, but your dad can't see, he'll smell you. Well, what about, what if he touches my skin? She says, well, just take some goat. We'll put some goat on you and it'll be the hair of the goat and he'll feel that and feel like that's Esau. Doesn't say much for Esau's skincare, does it? If, if you rub a goat and you go, oh, Esau, it's my son. But that's what she does. And this is what happens. He does it. She prepares a dish, kind of a gamey dish. He puts on some clothes and, and kind of tries to smell like and feel like. His brother Esau, and this is what happens in 27, 18. So he went to his father and he said, my, fa <clears throat> my father, because remember, he's, he's trying to sound like him too. He says, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am, <clears throat> I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit, eat my game that your soul may be blessed. But Isaac said to my son, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? And this is, what, this is how low Jacob stoops. And he said, because the Lord your God brought it to me. 
when you start including God in your schemes, in your lies, in your swindling and trying to steal from others, you have stooped to an all-time low. And, and Isaac says, wait a second, you don't sound like my son. You sound more like Jacob, but you smell like. And you feel because he felt his arm. He said, I guess it's my son Esau. And I can't see, so I'm gonna have to rely on my other senses to make sure that it's you. And he get, got up and he ate the dish and he and went through the ceremonial blessing of Jacob. And Jacob wins again by being the con artist. Jacob wins again by using God. God favored me. He brought me game so quickly. Because Father God was with me. I was able to hunt successfully, be back, prepare the meal. And you know what happens? Isaac blesses him. He gives him the, the Jewish blessing of the firstborn. Jacob leaves celebrating his victory and in comes Esau with his game, with his meal. And he says, Daddy, are you gonna bless me? He says, who are you? I'm your firstborn Esau. He said, I've already given your blessing to your brother. And Esau's anger burned. In fact, Rebekah was so worried that Esau was gonna kill Jacob. Rebekah says, you need to flee. You need to get out of town for a few days. She literally says, for a few days, flee until your brother's anger calms down and then you can come back. And you know that he was gone for 20 years because of his deception, because of his scheming, because of the fact that he stole his brother's blessing that he never got to see his mom whom he loved and his dad who he wanted to, wanted to please and receive his blessing again. They both passed when he was in a different country. She says, hey, go to my homeland, go to my, go to my brother and find yourself a wife there. And that enters into to really round three. Jacob wrestles his father-in-law. He comes and meets Laban. In fact, when he's on his way, he meets this beautiful young lady at a well. And he falls in love with her instantly. And he goes and meets Laban, her dad, and he starts working for Laban and staying at his house. And after working for a while, Laban says, why is it that you're working for me for free? You just, you're helping my, my ranch. I wanna bless you, name your price. And Jacob so much wanted to marry Rachel, his beautiful daughter, that he said, I'll work for you as a dowry to earn the right to marry your daughter, Rachel. And so they, they decide on a seven year work. Now, I don't know what you got for a dowry, but uh, I sure didn't get seven years of labor uh, from my father-in-law or I didn't have to do that. So, uh, and probably the most romantic verse in all scripture, this is crazy. It says this, that Genesis 29, 20, just read it on the screen, it says, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Everybody go, oh, that's probably the rom most romantic thing said in scripture. He worked for seven years out on the ranch for Laban, tending his flock, being really the keeper of everything that Laban had. But seven years just seemed like a few days because of his love for Rachel. Now, ding, 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 round three, Laban is a con artist father-in-law. And it's hard to con the con man, but he does. This is what happens. He says, you've worked for seven years. Scripture tells us that Laban had two daughters, Rachel, who was beautiful, and Leah, who was weak at the eyes, which not much to look at, okay? She was the older, and she was not quite easy to look at like Rachel was. And this is what Laban does. He sees his soon-to-be son-in-law. He says he's worked for seven years and he's done a great job. In fact, my ranch has flourished. It's never been this profitable. God blesses Jacob as he's tending the ranch of Laban. So Laban says, hey, during this process, we're gonna celebrate. I'm gonna give you my daughter and you're gonna be married. And so on the wedding night, maybe a little darker veil, maybe a little too much wine, and all of a sudden the lights are out, it's dark. And the next morning, Jacob wakes up. You know, he's all excited. He's giving it kind of the stretch. And yeah, and he looks over and wow, it's Leah. <laughs> the ugly sister. <laughs> I, oh, I know it's just, it's scripture. It's truth. I have to preach it. So 
he runs downstairs to Laban and says, what have you done? You've swindled me. You've tricked me. And Laban goes, oh, yeah, oh, that. It's not our custom to give the younger daughter first. So I gave you Leah. And he says, that's not what we planned for. I worked seven years for Rachel and I woke up with Leah. He said, I tell you what, seven more years and I'll give you my daughter, Rachel. Round three, Jacob loses. The con man gets conned. The schemer gets had. And you see that, wait a second, I'm the one who's usually taking advantage of people and Laban gets 14 years of labor in order that Jacob could marry Rachel, his love. And you see that throughout life, we'll look at it next week when we look at Joseph, we'll look at the fact that that never goes well when you deal with, with having two wives and just the insecurity and the, the, the jealousy between those, especially with sisters. And so he gets conned and he works for 14 years and Laban actually kind of gets him to stay on for six more. For 20 years, Jacob runs the family ranch and it flourishes. Now the end of round three, Jacob kind of ties the match. Laban says, you know what? I, I, I need to give you some of my sheep, some of my, my flock, because you've been working for, for me all this time. And this is, this is a great story. You can't make this up. This is a scripture. He says, I tell you what, the spotted livestock are kind of rare. I tell you what, Jacob says, I'll just take all the spotted livestock and you take all of the all white or all black, the purebreds, and I'll just take the spotted and we'll call it even. And Laban said, that sounds like a great plan. And Jacob goes to work manipulating the strongest and the best livestock to be spotted. He actually does kind of genetic manipulation. Thousands of years ago, he does this so that the spotted livestock grew and the purebreds shrunk. And after 20 years, he says, Laban, I'm out of here. See you. He flees basically in the middle of the night with Laban's daughters and most of Laban's livestock successfully because they're spotted and he claimed all the spotted livestock. And he was a rich man on the run. So we're gonna call round three, even though Laban gets him with Leah and gets 20 years of labor, but at the end, he swindles him back and steals or at least manipulates most of Laban's livestock. And that's when we come on really the, the greatest round, the defining moment for Jacob's lifestyle. And anybody that thinks the Bible is boring, you just got to read stories like this because it, this is more exciting than any soap opera that you can watch on TV, all right? So he's on the run. He's kind of made his peace with Laban and said, I'm, gonna, I'm leaving you. And Laban said, good riddance. I hope to never see you again. And 20 years later, he's on his way back to meet Esau, thinking, hoping hoping that the sibling rivalry, that the anger that Esau was ready to kill Jacob had subsided over 20 years, but he's going back a very wealthy man with a big family and a lot of livestock. And all of a sudden, one of his, one of his men come back and says, Esau is coming to meet you. He says, oh, great. He goes, with 400 men. That doesn't sound like a welcoming party, okay? That sounds more like an army. And so before we get to round four with Jacob, we see the fact that Jacob plots he says, I'm gonna put my families, I'm gonna separate everybody into two groups so that if he pursues one to kill him, the other one will flee. And at least half of my family will, will be preserved. And he says, I'm gonna give a peace offering. And he sends all of these livestock, hundreds of, of animals spaced out so that Esau would come across a group and say, hey, this is, this is my servants, Jacob. This is a gift for you because he loves you and he misses you because he doesn't want you to kill him, okay? That's really what it was. This is a peace offering so that you don't kill Jacob. And when he gets all those lined up, the night before he's gonna meet them, he sends his wives on up ahead across the river, the Javik River, and he spends some time alone. And the first thing you need to know about before we get to God versus Esau, I mean, uh, Jacob versus God, when Jacob wrestles God, you have to know that this only happened because Jacob spent some alone time. And I fear for our, our culture, our nation, because I don't think that we ever spend time alone. 
In fact, if you go to a waiting room or you go somewhere where people are by themselves, the first thing they do is they pull out their phone because you can't sit there and let your imagination run wild. You can't people watch. You can't just maybe make conversation with a stranger because we're not, we're not used to being alone. If we have 10 seconds without something stimulating our eyes, we have to pull out our phones and get our brains occupied with something typically as exciting as you know, Snapchat or YouTube, right? Jacob spent time alone and ding, 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 round four happens. And this is one of the most spectacular moments in all the scripture because this is what happens. Genesis 32, verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. Now he saw that he did not prevail against him. He touched the socket of his hip And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint and he wrestled as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go before day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called that place Peniel, for I have seen the face of God and my life is preserved. Round four, the pinnacle moment of Jacob's life, this swindler, this schemer, this con artist is left alone and and God approaches Jacob, and doesn't talk to him. He doesn't bring him great news. He doesn't sing him a song or a lullaby so that he can go to sleep on the night before he meets his brother. God grips a hold of him and starts wrestling with him. Now, this is an odd thing for us to think about, God wrestling with man. And you think that they wrestled all night long. But I think back to when my my boys were much, much smaller. Now when we wrestle, I have to actually pay a lot of attention. Okay, I've got to work. Uh, Otherwise, the old man's going to get hurt. But I'm going to hurt them first because I'm not going to lose, right? Because we can still take them, right, dads? But when they were small and I would get down on on all fours and I would wrestle and I'd let them run and take me and I would fall down like they got me. I'd go, oh, got me. And they would they would kind of hold me down and I would move my arms and I would give just enough fight just enough resistance so they kind of thought they were in it, right? But we knew as dads that any moment I could flip that switch and overpower that child. I didn't because it was my son that I loved and that I enjoyed this wrestling match and they would get red-faced and sweaty and work and they would all three hit me at one time and I would just, I would under control, power under control, I would let them think they were in it. And so there's a few things that we can learn from. There's, there's some takeaways from this wrestling match. The first thing is that God initiated this wrestling match. He initiated the confrontation. See, I always thought that Jacob saw God and he said, all right, God, it's on. Here we go. I'm, I'm afraid for my life. I've got Laban behind me who hates me. I got Esau in front of me who I think wants to kill me. I am literally between a rock and a hard place. And the match is on. But no, it was God himself who approached Jacob in the middle of the night. And instead of tapping him on the shoulder, instead of whispering into his ear, everything's gonna be all right, I'm gonna bless you. God grips a hold of Jacob and says, you've wrestled with man. You've conned out people. You've you've schemed and tricked. How about you and I go at it, big boy? And they start wrestling In fact, it says it's an even match throughout the night until God flexes his muscle. I love this. God shows his power. Why? He just takes a finger and he touches the hip socket of Jacob and his hip is out of place. In fact, he has a limp. He has a handicap the rest of his life from this wrestling match with God. But even through the pain of having a dislocated hip, even the power of God touching Jacob and changing his life forever, Jacob doesn't give up. I love that about him. Jacob fights tenaciously. 
even lame with a bad hip, he holds on to God. And it's about to be sunrise and God understands that it's so dark out, he can't see my face. But if Jacob can see my face, what's gonna happen? He's gonna die. And God, the gentleman that he is, he could overpower Jacob and throw him across the river if he wanted. But God says, let go of me. Because he's tapping out, absolutely not. Because God is a gentleman. And when you're sinning and walking away from God, God may whisper in your ear, come back, I love you. You're going down the wrong path. But God is a gentleman. He won't force you. He won't make you. He won't take you and break you. Not every time. Oftentimes he just whispers in your ear, it's time to let go of the thing that you're holding on to so tightly. And God does it, why? For his benefit. He doesn't want Jacob to die. He doesn't want Jacob to see his face when the sun rises. And Jacob fights tenaciously. When you're struggling with God, when you're walking through that valley, when you're between the rock and the hard place, you've got Laban behind you and Esau in front of you. Hold on to God tightly. Don't hold on to the world. Don't hold on to the things of this culture that say they're gonna bring you satisfaction because they just bring emptiness. Hold on to God. And I love it. He says, hey, God asked him, what's your name? Remember, we just read a few minutes ago when his dad asked him, what's your name? And he lied and said, it's Esau, because I want to trick, I want to lie. I want to scheme my way into being blessed. And now he's wrestling with his heavenly father. And God asked, anytime God asks a question, he's really not kind of in the dark. He's not needing to know. He's trying to teach us something. God said, last time someone asked you, you lied about it. Are you going to be honest with me? What's your name? He said, my name is Jacob. It means schemer, supplanter. I'm, I'm going to be the one that grabs the heel and tries my whole life to, to sneak my way into first place. And God says, no, no, no. No longer is your name Jacob. I'm going to call you Israel. The name of the nation that is God's own people. Jacob, you are the namesake for the people who struggled, who wrestled with God and man and prevailed. You survived. You went all 12 rounds. And I'm going to give you a new name. God wants to give us a new name. When we come to him broken, when we come to him fearful, when we come to him in our weakness and we hold on so tightly, he says, I want your old life to disappear. And I want you to be a child of God. I want you to be my son, my daughter, and I want you to act like a child of God. And he says, no longer are you Jacob, but you are Israel, the namesake for the nation of all of his people. And then the last thing that we can take away is Jacob limps away with a new walk and a new name. Anytime that we're stuck between that rock and the hard place, anytime we have a bad option behind us, we're running from our past, we're running from our own consequences, we're running from the mistakes that we've made in the past, and we're going toward a future that is uncertain. And we wrestle with God and God transforms us. God changes us to the men and women that he's created us to be. We better walk away with a different walk and a different name. Every day of Jacob, Israel's life, he walked up and he had a limp. And every step reminded him, man, I wrestled with God. And God blessed me with a new name, with a new outlook on life, with new great leadership. Was he perfect after that? Absolutely not. But he understood that God, who was all powerful, was for him and not against him. And that God's grace was greater than his shortcomings. God's grace was greater than his insecurities of not being loved by his father not living up to his father-in-law's standard, of having two wives who didn't like each other, of having these sons that were battling just like he battled with his brother. God's grace is bigger, is greater than anything that you've gone through. God's grace 
is bigger and better than any shortcoming that you experience, that I experience. And when we do that, he says, he holds on to him. And and Jacob says, what's your name? He says, why do you even ask me my name? And he blesses him. The blessing that he desired from his father, that he had to sneak his way in to steal. As he's holding on to his heavenly father, God blesses him and he lets go. And he limps away with a new name and a new walk and a new outlook on life. God wants to use each one of us, but he wants to change us. He wants us to hold on to him through the most difficult and weakest times of our lives. And God wants to bless us by using us, by growing us, by developing us into the men and women of God that he's created us to be. Do you feel like you're wrestling with God? Because he wants to bless you. He wants to change you. And he wants you to walk away knowing that he loves you more than anything and that he wants to use you in a powerful way.